Joining us now to analyze today's headlines is Courtney Morris, sitting in for Robert Jensen. She's an assistant professor of African American and Women's Studies at Penn State University. Hi, Courtney. Hi, Sonali. Newly obtained documents from the CIA have been turned over by the ACLU to the Guardian newspaper, and they reveal that the agency not only tortured detainees after 9-11, but effectively turned them into subjects of experimentation. Even though the CIA has a long-standing policy against sponsoring, contracting, or conducting human experimentation, the documents reveal the agency's director has had the discretion to, quote, approve, modify, or disapprove all proposals pertaining to human subject research. CIA doctors operating with the Office of Medical Services, or OMS, were intimately involved in overseeing torture techniques such as waterboarding. They observed the reaction of torture subjects and offered advice on how far a technique could be taken. According to Guardian reporter Spencer Ackerman, and the extensive notes from CIA doctors on the interrogations as they unfolded brought OMS into the realm of human experimentation, particularly as they helped blur the lines between providing medical aid to detainees and keeping them capable of enduring further abusive interrogations, end of quote. Well, Courtney, we've known that doctors and psychologists have been involved in the CIA's torture program. Is the term human experimentation a valid one, you think, to describe what they were involved in? Uh, not exactly. I think the term war crime would probably be more appropriate. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, the cardinal rule of medical practice is first do no harm. Um, and it's clear that the doctors and psychologists who worked with the CIA um, to develop these enhanced, these so-called enhanced ter interrogation techniques, um, clearly did not follow this mandate. We know there have been number, a number of accounts from uh, former detainees as well as current detainees um, at Guantanamo and other so-called black sites. Um, and we've learned that, you know, these, these detainees were basically used as guinea pigs so that the CIA could find out how far it could go um, in torturing them without actually killing them. And this hardly sounds like first do no harm. Um, so, you know, and I think uh, as we learn more and more about the CIA's interrogation tactics, what's worst of all is that we know, based on the recent report released by the Senate, that these enhanced interrogation techniques have not, in fact, done much uh, to yield information about terrorist activity or, in fact, to keep the country safe. So it's horrifying to see um, just how far these doctors have gone. And an Egyptian judge has just sentenced Mohamed Morsi to death. The Muslim Brotherhood leader technically became the first democratically elected president since the revolution that toppled Hosni Mubarak, although his rule was widely unpopular. After being ousted by the military-dominated regime of Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, he has remained in prison. The death sentence is bizarrely linked to a jailbreak during the 2011 Egyptian revolution that toppled dictator Hosni Mubarak. Morsi and many others had been imprisoned without charges at the beginning of the uprising and broke out of prison soon after in a widely publicized incident for which he was never punished and which was never raised before his run for president. Morsi plans to appeal the sentence. Despite the fact that his crimes are a fraction of Mubarak's, he has been sentenced to death while Mubarak was initially exonerated. Earlier this month, a court announced that Mubarak would face a retrial for his role in violence against protesters. Courtney, is this yet another nail in the coffin of the 2011 Egyptian revolution? Um, it certainly appears to be so. I think we're really witnessing the reemergence of authoritarian rule in Egypt. And I mean, certainly there are uh, many fair critiques that one can make of the Muslim Brotherhood, but it seems like uh, the general public in Egypt has really been shocked by the heavy handed way um, that the government has been dealing with them. And there seems to be a lot of concern on the ground that this repression is really going to have an adverse effect in terms of, of radicalizing or, or rather militarizing younger members of the Brotherhood um, who um, are really angry about the treatment that they're receiving at the hands of the state. So this is a very volatile situation. Um, and, and Western diplomats in Egypt have been um, hopeful that um, President al-Sisi al will rescind the death sentence um, in order to avoid exacerbating an already very violent mm -hmm. um, situation. And finally, yet another GOP hopeful has thrown his hat into the presidential ring. This time it's Jeb Bush, former Florida governor and more importantly, younger brother of George W. Bush, arguably the most reviled president in U.S. history. In a speech at Miami-Dade College yesterday, the younger Bush promised that as president he would deliver, quote, 4 percent growth and 19 million new jobs. Twenty minutes into his speech, however, he was confronted by pro-immigrant activists demanding humane immigration reform and paths to citizenship. A week ago, Bush faced another challenge during an interview on MSNBC when he was asked to respond to a section from his book, Profiles in Character. In it, he had written a chapter entitled The Restoration of Shame, where he called out single mothers for their, quote, irresponsible conduct. Well, Courtney, it seems like a long road to climb for Jeb Bush to really win over the public. Or is it possible we may see a third Bush take office in 2016? Uh, you know, Sonali, this is America, so anything is possible, <laughs> even a 
even a third Bush administration. But, you know, I think that Jeb's problem is really that he's, he's going to have to try very hard to be all things to all people. And it's not uh, clear yet whether anyone is actually buying. I mean, particularly on the issue of immigration reform, you know, coming from Florida, he's tended to take a much softer approach uh, to immigration than many of his Republican uh, competitors have taken. And I think that that's something that's not going to play all that well to his conservative base and to his own party, which is ultimately who he needs to appeal to in order to win the nomination. On the other hand, you know, he's trying to backpedal on some of the other issues around income inequality, talking about extending opportunity to all Americans and making sure that that uh, that there's more of a, of a level playing field for all Americans. And at the same time, he's also deeply invested in reinforcing the same policies of free trade uh, and, and sort of, uh, you know, neoliberal economic reform that uh, that everybody is doing. So he's going to have a, a tough road to hoe moving ahead and, and really trying to cater to all of the different parties, all the different constituencies that he needs to win over. Well, Courtney Morris, thank you so much for joining us. We'll talk to you again tomorrow, actually. Bye, Sonali. Courtney Morris is an assistant professor of African-American and women's studies at Penn State University, sitting in for Bob Jensen. This is Uprising. We'll be right back.